Hey, sit on it. It's me, Richard Herring. Welcome to another Rahala Sapa. I was just channeling the funds. Can't you remember the funds? He was cool, man, like me. So welcome to the Rahala Stupa. This is, comes from the Bristol Old Vic, one of my favourite venues in the world. I mean, I haven't been to them all, but all the ones I've been to, it's just right up there with one of my favourite people in the world, Mark Olver. Very funny man. You may not have heard of him. Please stick around if you haven't, because you're going to love him. He's very funny. He's very interesting. Uh, and he's got a lot of tales to tell. Um, and, uh, yeah, if you like these podcasts, why not come and see one live in 2020? Go to richherring.com slash gigs so you can find out where I'm going to be. At the moment, so that's the Leicester Square Theatre in March and April, uh, Birmingham, March 28th, and Norwich in April. Both Birmingham and Norwich look like they're going to sell out, and I will be very quick if you want to come to those one of those two or both of those two Norwich gigs. There aren't many tickets left. Go to gofasterstrike.com to buy your yeah, badges, yeah card games, your books and your DVDs if you're into that kind of malarkey. Everything helps us keep these things going. I want to do lots more interesting stuff in 2020 and I would like to thank you so much for the support you have given me over the years. It makes an old man feel very happy. Okay, let's sit back, relax and enjoy Rahala Stepa with Mark S. Olver. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Bristol Old Vic. Please welcome a man who the last time he was here, he was sitting in a royal box with Sid Little, and that's true, it's Richard Herring! <laughs> wow! Look at this! Amazing! Thank you very much! Thank you, love to see you. Thank you, Bristol. It's always fantastic to be here. I was just in Leicester last, and honestly, that place is the worst. <laughs> they won't mind me saying it's the shittest place in the world, so being anywhere would be great after that, but being in Bristol is fantastic. And yet, last time I was here, I was in that royal box there. I was sitting next to Sid Little from Little and Large, watching a WC Fields film. I was thinking, I've got to get a photo within the two rubbish ones from Two Double X together. <laughs> He had to go and get a train. I never got my photo with Sid. It's a lifetime regret. Anyway, welcome to Richard Herring's Loathing Slave Owner Theatres podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't play the Colston Hall if they paid me. <laughs> Even if it was open and they said, we reckon you can sell that many tickets, I wouldn't go there. It's named... People at home won't know it's named after a slave owner. Though they may change the name when it reopens. Who knows? Uh, Colston. Ian Colston. <laughs> made. So we're here at the Old Vic. Though I've just found out today Old Vic was the most racist man in Bristol. Actually, he was so... He was so racist. He was actually worse than owning slaves. That's how bad he was. Really properly full-on racist. So uh, I have to give this one a miss as well. It's cancelled now. After, after next time, I'll do the gig tonight. I won't be coming back next week. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> but uh, I was talking to the uh, first ever bungee jumper. The first ever bungee jumper was jumped off of uh, the Clifton Suspension Bridge, as you know. It's very cool. He calls it Rahal <laughs> Um It is great to be... Oh dear. It's great to be in Bristol. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it is fantastic. Bristol, lots of, uh, lots of things uh, to be very proud about Bristol. Ribena was invented in Bristol by Ian Ribena. Um, the uh, Easter eggs were invented in Bristol by the fries and, and chocolate, solid chocolate, that's not bad. The blanket was invented in Bristol, and you wouldn't think the blanket would need inventing, but it did. And do you know who it was invented by? Edward Blanket. I'm not even fucking kidding. <laughs> um, uh, but the best thing, uh, well, there's two great Brist uh, breasts were invented here in Bristol, so, yes. so well done for that. But even better than that, the Bristol stool chart, that must be what you are the most proud of here. 
was invented in Bristol, which is uh, someone in Bristol, the hospital in Bristol, wanted to classify all the different types of poo there were. Uh, and they must have studied really hard. They came up with seven different types. I have seven different types a day, mate. That is not, there's more than seven. Just to run you, this is the Bristol stool chart. This is a real thing. It's named after your city. Which I would take as an insult. Um, type one, separate hard lumps like nuts. Yeah, if, you have, if you've had this one recently, cheer for it. That's what I'm saying. So any, anyone, that is hard to pass. I've, I've never had nuts. I'm just saying. Uh, type two, sausage shaped but lumpy. <laughs> type three, like a sausage, so sausage shaped. I mean, it's, that's, but with cracks on its surface. Someone's job was to do that. Uh, someone was getting, uh, getting, do you mind if I have a look at your poo? Oh, that's, that's, no, that's a three. <laughs> type four, like a sausage. I mean, they're all like sausage, aren't they? It's not like a sausage or snake. They're just trying to pretend that they thought of a different thing. Oh, yeah, it's like enough. Smooth and soft, that's the best type to have, if you've got that, well done. Type five, soft blobs with clear cut edges. Easy to pass. Type six, fluffy pieces with ragged edges, a mushy stool. Yeah, <laughs> that's, my, that's my general, I think that's my general. Type seven, watery, no solid pieces, entirely liquid. We've all been there, so it's, uh, it's, it's a Sunday. I think there are more than seven types. Uh, my son, uh, did one the other day. And my son is two years old, not quite. And uh, he did one that was honestly as big as a can of Coke. <laughs> and like much bigger than he is inside. I mean, that's, I call it the reverse TARDIS because it's much bigger on the outside than it could possibly have been on the inside. That is, but like that thick, I don't know how it came out. I mean, I haven't studied his asshole in a lot of detail, but it's, it's really little. <laughs> so they, have, they, they missed that one. Anyway, I hope you enjoy my stuff. So we've been raising Kickstart money and I spend it all on this. <laughs> we ran the money a bit up there, so we could, the staircase ran out. <laughs> just the piano, some busts of stuff. You know, just, it's important. We can only use it here in the Bristol Old Vic. <laughs> We're just trashing that the minute this is over. There's genuinely backstage, we're not allowed to touch it because it's a prop, but there's a genuinely a big tray of Ferrero Rocher's backstage, which... <laughs> It felt like a little a reference for me. But anyway, we're, uh, we're going to crack on with our show. Uh, so our, our first only guest this week, for the, he's the first and only guest, is probably best known for his warm-up work on two episodes of For Fact's Sake. That is why we're here tonight. It's actually quite hard to choose something for him, and that almost is the best thing that he has done. <laughs> Will you please welcome the amazing Mark Over, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Bristol Come here. You sit, you sit there. Sit there, hello. Pick up a microphone, I should have said that. Pick up a microphone. How are we doing? I'm all right, thanks. Yeah. I've just discovered that the best thing I've ever done is two episodes <laughs> of a short-lived TV show with yeah. Brendan O'Carroll. Yeah, yeah. I, so I was interested in that. So was it was it the I Don't Remember This Show. It's quite recent. Yeah, uh, last year. Yeah. Yeah. So Mrs. Brown's Boys, is that the guy? Uh, yeah, Brendan. Yeah. Uh, uh, hosted uh, a show that definitely wasn't QI. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they filmed it. They filmed it in Glasgow uh, before uh, they filmed Mrs. Brown's Boys. Right. He wanted to film it after Mrs. Brown's Boys, but they filmed it before Mrs. Brown's Boys because he wanted to host it with his moustache. Right. Because he has a moustache, okay, yeah. which he has to get rid of when he's Mrs. Brown. But then they didn't have enough time after Mrs. Brown to do the show uh, and wait for the moustache. To grow back so and he did it moustache. before. Okay, well, that's interesting to know. Good fact, isn't it? It is. <laughs> I reckon he'd get away with the moustache, but it's not, I don't think he's really convincing many people with Mrs. Brown, eh? <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're right. <laughs> but this was, the, this was genuinely in the contract. And that was... Filmed 2018. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. They did six episodes, and I think actually I did more than two. I think I did. Well, there's only two on IMDb, but a lot of your work is not on IMDb because you've just told me about five things backstage that you've oh, casually yeah. tossed in. Yeah, but also you've been trying to Google me to find out shit. Yeah. You've not found out anything. I haven't. You mentioned bungee jumping. Yeah. You might not have known that my dad was not there <laughs> at the first ever bungee jump. I did not. <laughs> 
as long as his job wasn't to tie up the bungee at the top, that doesn't really matter. That is it. My dad was uh, <laughs> my dad uh, was a policeman in the Clifton area of Bristol in the mid seventies when the bungee jump yeah. happened, and uh, he found out. So uh, it, are most people here Bristolian. Yeah. Okay, so I can be sort of specific with locations and geography because, like, uh, uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, my, uh, so my dad's patch was Clifton, and he was on uh, Hot Wells Road, near the Rose of Denmark, when he got on his radio, uh, PC over, PC over, uh, something's happening on the suspension bridge, get to the suspension bridge, some people are gonna throw themselves off the suspension bridge, <laughs> attached to pieces of elastic, can you get there now? And he was like, I'm on my way. And by the time he got from the roads of Denmark to the suspension bridge, it had finished. <laughs> just gone. He was at the bottom just trying to grab him. They kept on jumping and dancing out of yeah. the way. No, he just, he missed the whole yeah. thing. Like, I think the, the overs must be genetically programmed <laughs> to not quite be there when successful <laughs> things happen. It was quite a punt, though, wasn't it? I don't know how much preparation those guys... The Oxford University Dangerous Sports Society, I believe, that yes. did that. But do you think... How, I mean, if it was the first one... Does that mean it was the first one ever, or had they tested it a bit somewhere else? Because it's quite a risk to do it. And sort of started on low bridges, yeah. iron bridge, suspension yeah. bridge. Or just chuck something over attached to some elastic <laughs> and see whether it bounces or not. I mean, it's quite a specific they thing, isn't it? tested it, it like, then it's that the takes first. away the magic, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's some bullshit there. It I is. want someone to literally... <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what we all want, and it would have been quite satisfying if my they dad, had... My dad's other claim to fame yeah. uh, was there is a uh, Samaritan sign on the suspension bridge, and it was my dad's idea okay. to put it there. That is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> he claims. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say the Samaritans probably deserve more of a round of applause than your dad's. It was my idea to put the number on there. Well, it's my fucking idea to have the Samaritans, mate. <laughs> I think it was the Samaritans' idea. <laughs> <right there. laughs> it was. <laughs> but, you know, he had that terrible thing where he saw that guy jumping off and disappearing. And then, <laughs> yeah, that was a very good point. That must and never happen himself, again. Oh, shit, that gives me an idea. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so that's all you found out that's, about me. That's, well, I know your mum worked at a cinema. <laughs> yeah. Quality shit. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. God, this is going to be an amazing hour. I mean, it was very difficult to find stuff out about. All it. these people were like, oh, "It's going to be Russell Howard." <laughs> It'll be Russell Howard. So like, oh, John Robbins. It'll be John Robbins. <gasps> John Richardson. Matt Ewins. Like, oh no, it's the fat flat mate. <laughs> uh, my mum worked in the cinema that is now the. Is it still called the Academy? Yes. Thanks. The yeah. yeah. nightclub. Okay. And that was the ABC on Frogmore Street. Okay. Um. Do you know her? Do you know his mum? Uh, yeah. Philomena, my mum's name. Except it's not actually her name. <laughs> I want to know no more about that. You don't want to know anymore? Uh, no, I want to know. Why is, she not, why is her name Philomena, but that's not her name? So my mum was uh, brought up in a convent. Okay. Uh, genuine, like proper, 1948 she was born properly like left on the step of a convent wow. um, and taken in and there was like a note saying this is Mary Philomena Old Griffin that was her maiden name Mary Philomena Griffin um, and in the same week uh, in the same convent another baby was put in called Mary Philomena Griffin what? so they called that one Mary Philomena and my mum Philomena Mary. Someone was churning those girls out, weren't they? That's the, <laughs> Mrs. Griffin, Miss Griffin, probably. Yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because I don't think that's how babies work. You don't have a baby and then a week later you're like, oh, I'm ready for another one. <laughs> Maybe there was just another one in there that she hadn't been expecting that yeah. just popped out a week later. Trying to fuck, I've got to think of another name. Yeah. I've got to oh, get another basket. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm not George Foreman. <laughs> I've just called them... Um, um, so yeah, so and then we found uh, my mum found about ten years ago the other Mary Philomena Griffith. Okay. So my mum, my mum's name is Phil. Right. She's Philomena. Yeah. Oh, Does Phil. she? Did she ever find her, the the mother that left her on the doorstep? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they get this. Usually, they don't put their full name in, do they? 
don't usually, they usually leave them on the doorstop and say, this is a baby, I'm not going to tell you who I am, fuck off. And I'm going, You've got to look after it now. They don't usually say, I know, so her name is Griffin and I live at this address. Yeah, that's Please. a good point, actually. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Yeah. I mean, but she was, uh, she found my nan when I was like nine or ten. Okay. And we had this whole other family that we didn't know about. And even like at the moment, like literally right now, um, they are still trying to work out who my granddad is because my nan never know, told who it was. Right. We thought it might be the stepdad, the guy she married a couple of months later, but we don't think it's him, it's someone else. Wow. Typical Bristol whore, hey? Uh, but, uh... <laughs> London, London. Oh, London, OK. London. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike everyone else in London, a whore. When you said to me earlier, uh, you said, if there's anything in the uh, podcast that you're not 100% comfortable with, have a word with me and we'll just yeah. send me an email and we'll just cut it. Yeah. Would it be possible to, to take out the bit where you describe my nan as a typical... <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We're not sure. I'm not sure it will be. Typical I'm not Bristol sure. Hall. <laughs> just because it's... Accuracy, yeah, for accuracy. For accuracy. Just because she, was she wasn't not. Bristol. So if you do a typical London Hall, yeah. then I imagine then, then that can get through. <laughs> I don't think she was typical. Or, uh, uh, nothing about her was... Anyway. No, that's fair enough. I, I apologise. <laughs> she left babies on doorsteps. Fuck her. So, um... <laughs> what? Literally what? <laughs> what? You made what it about the your, other one? Your, the other one came out a week later. Oh. She wasn't even other people's babies. <laughs> she, got, she got addicted to it. <laughs> it's Moorish. If we're going to cut this, let's not do funny stuff. Um, <laughs> let's not do the funny stuff. Well, I, that, I, I didn't get any of this from, the, uh, so from my research. On... That's no research. But you're very hard man to pin down. You're a Bristol born and bred, proper Bristol man. Yeah, yeah. I'm Typical yeah. Bristol virgin man. Still, yeah. live, still live here. Yeah. Still live here. Yeah. As, apart from... I don't know if you know about this, but there's quite a lot of people who make a big deal of being from Bristol or being from the West Country who've not lived in the West Country for fucking years. <laughs> when did you last live in the West Country? Uh, I went to saw my mum and dad. Uh, you went to see my mum. Actually, not that recently. <laughs> no. yeah. Where was, like, I've stayed in. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm kind of, uh, yeah. Yeah, but you at least live in Bristol. I lived in Cheddar. That'd be an awful place to stay in forever. Yeah, least there's stuff to do in Bristol. Yeah, there's there's Cheddar Gorge, come on. It's not bad, yeah. Any Cheddar people in? Yeah, Kings of Wessex. Yeah. <laughs> Fairlands? Yeah. Still live there? Still live in Cheddar? No. <laughs> live in Bristol now? No. No. <laughs> Axbridge? <laughs> Where? Cornwall. Yeah. Cornwall. Cornwall, bloody. Typical Cornwall Hall. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is that how that works? <laughs> Depends how many babies she's left on set doorsteps. <laughs> Let's not back reference it, we're going to cut it. <laughs> oh, yeah, good point. You're getting rid of that. Good point. So let's talk about your... I mean, so you, you lived with, in a house with lots of comedians. Every... Every single Bristol comedian that's come through. Every person that I've ever lived with has been nominated or won the main <laughs> award in Edinburgh. Wow. <laughs> Every, every one of the pricks has yeah. won. <laughs> and I, I, you know, <laughs> they're success, whatever. I did two weeks of warm-up for Supermarket Sweep in Maidstone this year, so yeah. who's the real winner? <laughs> Russell, Russell Howard. Russell Howard, probably. Uh, I would say. But yeah, no, every, five of them. Uh, so we lived in a flat, uh, myself, uh, Russell Howard, John Richardson and John Robbins. Yeah. And now uh, I've got my own house. Uh, that, the flat was in Clifton, but I couldn't buy in Clifton, so I'm now uh, in Brislington. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, I live with Matt Ewins, who was yeah. nominated for the award uh, two years ago. So, wow. So everyone I've ever... <laughs> All of them. <laughs> yeah, but there's still time. <laughs> One day you'll do a show about all the all the stuff that you've, that's gone on behind the scenes. I don't think I will. No, no, I don't think I don't think I'll do Edinburgh. I don't think I, 
I mean, I don't really do stand-up. I probably no. gig, like I do charity gigs in Bristol. I maybe gig once or twice a month. I, I, I do warm-up six days a week. It's the weirdest fucking life. Yeah. How did you get into that? I mean, obviously, the, the, it's, 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 that, it's a really difficult job, and you clearly are doing it very, very well, because everyone employs you. I've done warm-up for shows that you have been on yep. and been out in the first round yeah. of Pointless. Yeah, time. yeah. Um, <laughs> you were backstage saying, Howard Jones, Rich, Howard Jones. <laughs> but he would, never got to number one, so it's a good job I didn't say it. Never get no, number one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I've been doing it since 2004. There was a TV programme uh, that they made. It was called Kings of Comedy. Oh, yes. It was uh, comedians in a Big Brother-style house. Does anyone remember this? Vaguely, yeah. That's, that's showbiz. I mean, this is 500 comedy fans, and they all just went, not a fucking clue. <laughs> Uh, old school comics, oh, new yeah, comics. Right. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, I think Andrew Maxwell was in there. Uh, Booth, uh, Andrew won it. Uh, right. Booth Bigrafo was in there. Ava Vidal, Janie Godley, but then Stan Boardman and... Uh, Mick Miller was in there. Mick was Miller was in there. The one that wasn't Lenny Henry or Tracy Ullman. David Copperfield. David Copperfield, yeah. he was in it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it could have gone a different way, couldn't it, when it was the one that wasn't Lenny Henry? I said, fuck, here we go. <laughs> Old vixen. <laughs> um, and, and they wanted to... Uh, they wanted to make a comedy club yeah. so they could do the performance in the comedy club uh, for the live show every Thursday. And I was running gigs at uh, Jester's now, which uh, used to be in the... Uh, Tesco's in Stokescroft that everyone was going to never use. And, <laughs> and now everyone uses. Okay. They were going to boycott that Tesco's forever and ever. Okay. Do you know this story? No. Yeah, they basically, they got rid of the comedy club and put a Tesco's in and it went really messy for ages. There was security there. It was going to absolutely kick off because uh, it's on Stokescroft and it was a Tesco's. Right. No one should ever go in there. And now it's really fucking popular. Yeah. <laughs> We don't care anymore. No one cares about anything anymore. You can do anything now. There's no, there's no repercussions for the worst, the worst crimes. Oh, no, not in Bristol. No. <laughs> oh, no, not in Bristol. We, we care. Okay. We care about... Uh... <sighs> <laughs> Zero waste. Okay. That's something we care about. Yeah. Got Bristol, Bristol money. You care the, about Bristol, Bristol money? Bristol pound. Bristol we pounds. care about that. We care about it to the extent that we care about it so much that we all refuse... To use it. Okay. <laughs> no one in this room has ever used the Bristol Pound. We're all really fucking proud of the fact that we've got the Bristol Pound. Yeah. But we don't use the Bristol Pound. I won't be accepting them after the show in return for books as well. <laughs> um, and so they came to watch me do the gig uh, to build the TV studio. And then they went uh, to look like a comedy club. And then they went, oh, well, we're doing it. Do you want to do the warm-up for it? And so I went, yeah, all right, I'll do the warm-up. So I did it. Uh, Russell Brown was, uh, was hosting it. Yeah. Um, and then a couple of months later, did some other shows in 2004. And then in 2005, uh, a show that I did a couple of times uh, in Bristol called Deal or No Deal started. Yeah. So I did sort of one or two of them. 3,000. I did 3,000 <laughs> 3, episodes. And how many a day do you do? It's often lots a day, right? We did about four a day. Four a day. We did, uh, we did four a day for almost exactly ten years. Right. And so they recorded 3,500 episodes of Deal or No Deal, and I, kept, and I did about 3,000 of them. Right. I've been in a, you know, a hot tub with Noel Evans. Yeah. <laughs> Was that how you got the job? <laughs> No. no. Um, <laughs> Is that how you get the two hundred fifty thousand pound box? <laughs> That's <laughs> what's in your box? No, I. Um, but and you came to. I a, did. It was one of the best days of my life. <laughs> I was a massive fan of Deal or No Deal, especially to begin with, in that early series. But but also because you learned very quickly the way to watch Deal or No Deal was yeah. to watch the first five minutes and then fast forward, <laughs> stop, fast forward, yeah. stop. 
watch the... So you could probably do an episode in like seven minutes, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But you liked it. You I fun. did like it. I, was, I found it fascinating to begin with and I liked the char- all the characters and I got to go to a party with all those... I think the first... We lot, did a maybe. gig together in uh, the Hen and Chicken in Bedminster yeah. and I was going to a Deal or No Deal contestant's reunion party. It was a reunion, yeah. <laughs> and I was comparing uh, for Rich and he said, what are you doing afterwards? Um... And you were, I don't know, you were probably just staying in Bristol and going to drink lonely in a hotel yeah, room? Yeah, I should think so, yeah. That's what I usually would do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> and, then, and then I said, oh, well, I'm going to this party. Yeah. And you were like, I, I mean, I don't know you well enough to go to a party with you and that sounds a bit shit. And I was like, I went to Deal or No Deal contestants reunion special and you were like, I'm in. <laughs> And it was amazing. It was amazing. It was, the most amazing thing about it was that there were people in there who were... There were a few people who recognised you. Yeah. So there weren't shitloads because this was before you became the man you are. The, the amazing, successful comedian <laughs> I am now, yeah. It was, after, it was sometime after the last time I was on TV, but yes. <laughs> it was in your <laughs> ditch years. <laughs> yeah. Do you yeah. describe them as yeah, I think so. I think so. Let's 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 use that vernacular. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it wasn't like it wasn't a deep ditch. No, like it what like I don't want to use gutter because that's that. <laughs> I think a gutter might be better than a ditch, though. To be honest, oh, at least the gutter's in town. <laughs> <laughs> you get ditches in town. What would you call fallow? You weren't fallow. I wasn't fallow. You were doing I was, well. I was doing all right. You were doing some really good shows. <laughs> <laughs> Financially, where were you? Um, well, I was all right because I'd just done Time, Gentleman, Please. So I was, I was, so I'd, I'd, I was well off, but not, but also a bit lost. So it's fair enough. So like, I was trying to work out what to do next, but I was, I'd started back into stand up at that point, obviously. So it was about two thousand and four, two thousand and five. Yeah, I exactly. So you so I was were... on my way back up out the, of the out of the. <laughs> I mean, off the Dick. off the quite tall hill. <laughs> I'd found a, a sort of rope ladder bridge that led to... The, a the, taller the, hill. The, yeah, the much taller hill I'm on now. Oh, OK, yeah. so you weren't in a ditch. No, I was just, on the rope ladder. You were... I was oh, on the rope ladder. A rope ladder. <laughs> Between two hills. Yeah. 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 So... <laughs> some people remember you from when you were on your higher peak. Yeah. Um, but you knew nearly all of I them did, yeah. because you were a fan of Deal or Yeah. <laughs> You were like, oh my God, it was you, you were on Fifty Pounds a couple of weeks ago. And they were like, we don't know who you are. And you were like, oh, I got very, very drunk. I remember one of the, that girl who was on for ages who wouldn't, um, what was her name? Uh, Lucy. Lucy. She did 50 episodes from Bristol. Actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She started licking the back of my neck at one point. Um, while I was talking to someone else, it was strange. <laughs> It was, that's the kind of wild things that go on at the deal. I don't think it was a sexual thing. I think it was uh, some kind of g- greeting. <laughs> Listen, like greeting. Uh, there was, was a just guy... a mistake in the back of my head for the front of my face. There was a guy there. Oh, shit. I wish I could remember his name. I think it was like Marcus or Mario or something like that. And he was a young... I remember his, his game brilliantly well because he was... Nowadays, when we talk about deal or no deal, it does sound like a weird thing to talk about because, like... <laughs> No one cares. <laughs> it's not on anymore. And for a lot of you, you didn't realise it wasn't on anymore. Like, <laughs> that's how little people... But at the time, like at that period, they, they were showing on TV two episodes a day. Like, there was during the World Cup in 2006, they would put on two... They would show an episode at four o'clock. And at five o'clock, Noel would say, see you in two hours' time. And then they'd show another one. Right. Like, it was... like. <laughs> 25%, the audience share was, was close to 25%. So a quarter of everyone watching telly <laughs> was watching Deal or No Deal. The reason they don't have um, children's ITV on ITV now is that kids stopped watching it because they would watch 22 people open boxing. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, it, was, it was a weird a phenomenon, but the one I remember was the first guy who thought he was going to win... The quarter of a million, and he got down to his final two boxes were a penny and quarter of a million. And he started screaming, I'm gonna be the first! I wanna be the first! <laughs> Woo! 
I'm gonna, and the offer he got was something like £90,000. I'm going to be the first! Woo! Yeah! He, 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 he wasn't the first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a cruel game. And I, 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 got, I got disenchanted because I thought Noel became too uh, imbued in the mythology of it. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to... He generally started believing boxes were unlucky and lucky and... And, the, and sort of seeing The death patterns. box, number 22. Yeah, yeah. and seeing patterns. And I, I wanted, I've talked about this before, but I wanted to do a late night version of it where they showed it again late night with some mathematical experts doing like a poker commentary over the top of it and go, is that true that the box 22 is... No, there's no statistical evidence that that is any more... In fact, if anything, you know, we look at the statistics, we'll see that box has come up a random, an average amount of time. I find it slightly insulting that you go on about not liking the mythology of it. Yeah. Like myself and the pilgrims. <laughs> you know, genuinely, that's what they called them. Yeah. The pilgrims, the dream factory, the walk of wealth, <laughs> the crazy chair, the death box. What I didn't like was the way he'd make people feel they'd lost if what was in their box was more than what they'd won. And that was not true, right? Because they'd won for a start, because they'd come in with nothing and they left with something. And as a, as a gambler or as a mathematician, you work out whether this was a good time to choose. So it's not what's in your box that matters, it's what you walk away with and whether you made a good choice at the time you did, I think. And that should have been the mark of it. And Noel Edmonds would go, oh, bad luck, you lost. You got £50,000, but you could have had £75,000, so hope it's not. Hope you can hold your head up and you walk down the street. <laughs> People aren't pelting you with shit for your poor decision. For example, if someone, if it's one P or £250,000, you know, that's a crazy, it's slightly crazy to decide to hold out for the 250000 But he wanted to be the first. I know, but he could have had £90,000. <laughs> he could have had £90,000. <laughs> <pounds. laughs> My favourite contestant ever uh, never made it on telly. Uh, so they used to stay in a hotel, uh, the Mercure, which is near uh, St. Mary Rec. I'll get really specific yeah. with geography. Um, and they used to stay there, and they used to get wank it <laughs> like every per so we used to do four games a day and so statistically of those four games someone would win a good amount of money and yeah. so at the end of the day they put their car behind the bar and people used to get absolutely slaughtered every single day shagging like honestly the scandal behind the scenes of deal all over was absolutely incredible in this hotel because there were 22 people plus their family plus the people who had left that day and the people who were coming the next day right. so in this hotel at any point 35 rooms 40 rooms card, credit card, where people were winning over 15 grand a day, yeah. people getting absolutely slaughtered, and thousands of people were applying to be on this show. Like, hundreds of thousands of people, every time an application would come in, and you'd have to go to auditions and screen tests, and the, the process of getting on was incredibly difficult, and this one bloke made it, and he got on, and he got to the hotel, and he was told he was going to play the next day, and he got so excited and got drunk and ended up in reception at three o'clock in the morning, covered in his own shit. <laughs> <laughs> On a Bristol stool chart, what kind of shit? <laughs> and it wasn't even in the safe zone of four, five and six. It was like a, an, an eight. <laughs> um, and, uh, and he never made it. They, they, they didn't let him on. They went, you've embarrassed yourself. That's not... He could have washed. You... They couldn't let him wash. <laughs> I don't think they were expecting him to go on covered it. But yeah, no, he walked up covered in his own shit and went, oh, I'm really sorry. I, I think I've just pooed in the hallway. <laughs> like, statist the chance of getting on Deal or No Deal <laughs> was less than winning on Deal or No Deal. Like... The big thing was getting on, and he fucked it up by shitting himself the night before going on. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh, another uh, of the warm-up guys for Deal or No Deal has been quite disparaging about it, and I don't know how openly he's been about the way he was treated, which is Ian Boldsworth, who's been on this show before. Yeah. I can't remember if he talked about it in our podcast, but he's talked about it on his website and yeah stuff and like he's that. done uh, I think he did a bit in an Edinburgh show about it he's done right. stand up about yeah. it quite a lot of people have done stand up about it I think Ellis James has yeah. John Robbins uh, did it for a little bit as well yeah yeah quite a lot of people have so I don't know I, I mean you're treated fairly badly doing warm up 
Yeah. Like, because you're, you're, you're not... In TV, like, talent is, you know, key. Yeah. And so, in, you know, as the warm-up, you just try and not fuck them off. Yeah. You know, you just, I did some warm-up on Friday for an advert. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, it was an advert uh, that was meant to look like a theatre comedy club okay. environment. And I got called at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, and my, my job was to entertain the audience uh, while the advert wasn't being filmed. Right. But the audience were paid extras. So they didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> but also the director was having to direct them to see, to get the shots as the day went on. And I got there at 8, and I went on at uh, 6 p.m. Right. I just sort of sat about. But people forget about the warm-up to the extent where I literally played a game where I, I tried to... That's a bit in Guardians of the Galaxy 2, I think, where Drax... Is it Guardians of the Galaxy 2 or Avengers? I feel like I'm in the audience where <laughs> one of you will know the answer to yeah. this. I think they will. Where Drax the Destroyer tries to make himself invisible. <laughs> what is it? Two. Thanks, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I did that for four hours. Right. <laughs> Sat at the back of the theatre, not moving, to see if anyone would notice I was there. Right. And they noticed. <laughs> Eight hours later. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is tricky, so it's a difficult thing to do well. Have you ever you, done it? Uh, no, I, I would be bad at it. I, I've, I've compared stand-up gigs, which is the closest I can get to, which is still a long, long way away from it, right? Uh, and you do that, you do that, you compare some, which I know you do lots of compare, and you've won awards for being a compare, um, but... I it, haven't. Have you not? Oh, you got no. nominated, you got nominated for... A, once. Once, yeah, that's good. <laughs> I'm going to give you an award for being, I think you're a very good compare. <laughs> You are a great, an excellent compare. But it's, you know, it's that thing, and the, the typical thing about compare is the audience come up to you after and go, you were pretty good, mate. You should try and be one of the proper comedians. You should, you should give it a go. Did you, did you ever get that? That's what... No. Okay, just me. Um, just, just me then. Uh, but, but, you know, so people sort of think you're... You know, they, they, they think you're just there as a, a buffer between the acts when you're, when you're the compare, and clearly that's a, a, a higher status job than warm yeah, but I'm sort of happy with that. Yeah, no, I don't think it's... I think... Like, I'm happy... I, I, the great thing about comparing is I always say, especially to new acts, I, I always say, look, fact of the matter is, if the gig goes well, you can take credit for it because people will go, oh, mate, you compared that gig amazingly well done you. And I'm like, thank you very much. I was absolutely brilliant. And then if it's shit, you just go, yeah, it was the act's fault. They were <laughs> Like, it's brilliant. Like, you don't... And TV warm-up is exactly the same. Yeah. Doing TV warm-up is like doing a gig like this in, with this beautiful lighting and this beautiful... I've done a gig... I've, I've done warm-up in here right. Right, for Noel Edmonds' Christmas presents. OK. <laughs> People were quite impressed by that. There's for them. Ooh. Which was amazing, but I had to do 45 minutes because a woman in... Not, not you, it wasn't you, but where that woman was sat, someone threw up and... <laughs> They had to, because it's such a beautiful old theatre, they had to really carefully mop up the sick. Yeah. So I had to spend 45 minutes warming up while they were messing up the sick <laughs> yeah. there. Yeah. Like, you know, it's, I don't see it as, it's, it's not a glamorous job. <laughs> I'm doing warm-up on Friday for a uh, celebrity dressage, and I'm on... <laughs> I'm on while they rake the sand. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. Uh, my favourite ever warm-up was a pro a, a program that did really badly called with, called Duel with Nick Hancock. Okay, G D U E L or G D U A L. Oh, Duel. There's three. I didn't even think of that meaning of it. <laughs> Hold on, which one am I? We've got a fly coming. In. Have you brought this fly from the dressage with you? Is this the, is this the horse shit? Hold on. No. I, it might... Duel. Was it like a duel? Or was it like... Duel, duel would be D-U-E-L. Duel, like you're going to win a duel. J-E-W-E-L. Or duel, like there's two different ways this could go. G-D-U-A-L. Ironically, there's three meanings to duel, which must be... They should have stopped that and said, well, we can't call it duel because there's three meanings. 
And probably someone's going to think of a fourth one in a second. Two people yeah. sat on a, a, a drum, a big stage area, a round okay. stage area, facing each other, answering questions in kind of like competitive... Well, I mean, that could be Jewel or Jewel. I mean, it's probably, unless they were going to win a Jewel, then it's not Jewel. So at least we've won, so if they were going to win a Jewel, it could still be Jewel. But I think it's... I would say it's probably Jewel. But they might have gone, hey, it's quite clever because there's two of them, let's call it Jewel. And then people might think it's, I wonder if it's Jewel. And, it uh, <laughs> and then I people go, wait, was... how are we going to Google this? I don't know. I think it was that one. My dear, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because they tried to make it quite competitive. They yeah. tried to make, so um, the, the two contestants, Nick Hancock was already uh, on the centre. Okay. And the centre was like... Was he in the centre of the drum in between the two people? He was on the centre of the drum. Was he dressed as a jewel? No, he wasn't. Okay. Or, or as a jester. <laughs> no, he wasn't. Um, <laughs> and there was uh, a big gap. It was eight foot off the ground. Yeah. So the Steadicam operator could get this amazing shot with his Steadicam running around the gap between the audience gap drum area. Right. And it was all very dramatic. I think I've painted it with words to feel dramatic. Yeah. And there was these two bridges that the two contestants walked across okay. to get onto the drum. Yeah. And, and they walked across and then the bridges went away. Oh, shit. And it was like, oh, like yeah. that's tense, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, if they <laughs> fall off, they might fall off. They might forget that the bridges have gone and they might fall off. I'd be worried about that. Well. Did anyone fall off? <laughs> it was all going very well until the day that one of the bridge operators <laughs> thought that the contestant was already on the drum <laughs> pulled the bridge back and because it was pitch black the bloke just vanished <laughs> and it was an eight foot drop onto yeah. a concrete floor and he just fucking went and so, whenever anything like that happens, literally the first thing that the floor manager director will do is automatically go, call warm up. <laughs> so I walked on over the bridge that was still there. <laughs> Nick Hancock ran off. Yeah. First aid went to this bloke, and I was attempting to entertain the audience. Oh, I thought, well, I thought you were telling jokes to the guy. Go, well, you know, it's like when you've got two broken legs. <laughs> no, but all I could hear was <laughs> below me, this bloke going, I've broken my leg. <laughs> I think I've broken my leg. <laughs> it's really dark down here. <laughs> <laughs> Is that... Oh, fuck. I nearly found some fireworks. <laughs> There's some pyrotechnics next to me. I've broken my leg. <laughs> so, everyone, what's your <laughs> favourite motorway service station? And, uh, yeah, that was wow. 30 minutes. Oh! <laughs> oh! Yeah, I mean, so it, it's like, it, you do the job. You yeah. just do the job. I did, I'm, I'm not sure I'm allowed to talk about it. It was in Bristol, I did... Uh, Tipping point, lucky stars. <laughs> and I can't tell you, I can't tell you what happened. You have to wait till it's on. Uh, but they would say, Ben Shepherd, who I'm trying to get on this show, uh, was I'm obsessed with tipping point. Uh, he uh, said that, again, it was, it's one of those things where it's, the, the machine is much, it's, it's all a little bit smaller than you think it is. Yes. But you're sort of face, you're facing a different direction than you think you are, and it's all there. And the day before, Rusty Lee had fallen into the machine. <laughs> I hope that'll make it onto the show. I did a couple of episodes of Celebrity Tipping <laughs> did you, Point. Yeah. Um, and again, tipping Point I, Lucky Stars, please. Tipping Point Lucky Stars. <laughs> and I don't know if... So we'll see when that goes out and when yeah. this goes out. Uh, but um, Alex Brooker was on okay. from The Last Leg. And I know Alex Brooker quite well. It was Alex Brooker, um, a guy from Emmerdale, okay. and uh, Joey Essex. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't know... Uh, Tipping Point uh, brackets, Tipping Point Lucky Stars. <laughs> yeah. um, you basically make money from how many of the counters go down. Yeah. That's right, isn't yeah. it? 
Yeah. You answer a question, you give an encounter, like that thing in uh, Fairgrounds and on uh, Piers. Piers, yeah. The coins come out, that's how much you win. And Joey Essex was answering the general knowledge questions on brand. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and you play the first round and the top two winners go through to the final round mm -hmm. and as a fan so I don't really watch it at pointless till I die but <laughs> how many counters do people normally get? Well that's the thing I, mean, I realised when I played it that it's it's difficult well it's just complete luck and so I played quite tactically and got rid of the well I tried to get rid of let's not give anything away tried to get rid of the person I thought was the biggest threat by going over and, and often he was and it he, Rusty Lee but it was, <laughs> it was <laughs> and he literally got nothing he was so angry with me this guy because I, I would just go I'll pass that one and then he, nothing would come out and then I got and I was up against then someone on Love Island uh, let's say I got through to the second bit and <laughs> Real, you know, and she got like about 15 out of all with the one question she got right. Joey Essex got 20. <laughs> Joey Essex answered one question correct yeah. and 20 tokens came out. <laughs> and Alex Brooker, we filmed it ages ago, he is still angry about that. <laughs> and it was the, the funniest thing about it, and I don't know if you hear it on the TV, but it's the noise of the counters because <laughs> they're quite big. So you just heard this Niagara Falls. <laughs> It is, and I want you to know before you watch mine, it's all luck. That's what, that's what I'm saying. That's the whole game is luck. Uh, but yeah, so it's great. Yeah, it's crazy. But uh, yeah, so, but it's good. I mean, it's in, you, you mean you're doing actually, like financially, you must be doing better than most yeah, comedians. Because I mean, you, yeah, you're I working bought a house in constantly. Bristol 10 years ago. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you mean work? Yeah. Oh, but you know, you, you are working. You work, what are you doing? Four Just shows? people know. Four shows. By, Buy a house in Bristol, 2009, yeah. 2010. Yeah. Because <laughs> I think Totterdown has sort of priced out a lot of people, really. And I think, especially because of the parking situation around there, whereas sort of the Arnus Vale area, especially with the work that's happening in Paintworks at the moment. Um, <laughs> they're not sure if they're going to build the arena or not, but I think some of the infrastructure that's happening down there, I think, has really helped okay. sort of the Bath Road area. <laughs> Um. <laughs> but you've worked constantly for like 15 years that must be 15 years of doing you know you're still doing stand-up you're still doing comp bearing you've, we should talk about your club as well but you, and we'll talk about your charity oh there's so, so little time we've had so much fun uh, but, um, but you know the, that constant work getting paid doing TV every day that's you know that's got to most people get on TV and then they do they fuck up somehow they say something <laughs> racist or sexist and I can say all that and it yeah. doesn't <laughs> okay. Yeah, oh, no, I am, like, stay, like, staying... I, I, was, I'm ne I was never as good a comic as any of my friends. Like, I'm sort of quite lucky. So I, I started gigging in October 1998 and, uh, in a gig called Virgin Murph, which was on Park Street, which is in a place called... I think it's now called The Ram, but it was called The Chateau at the time. And there was a gig every fortnight, and I did it one fortnight, and then two weeks later, Russell did it. Uh, and so we've known each other from that moment, and I had an all right gig, and then two weeks later, he and I just went, well, you're going to be famous, aren't you? <laughs> so from that moment, I never bothered with trying to be the best comic or trying to be uh, the most successful comic or trying to do any of that I simply just wanted to earn a living from yeah, it like yeah. it was like the least glamorous <laughs> way of viewing stand-up comedy I was just like I'm just, you know like a working class boy from one of the more boring parts of Bristol like I live in Brislington and grew up in Brislington and like Brislington is just a place you go through <laughs> <laughs> like yeah like there's not uh, is there any prison to be believed? Yeah. Where are you? <laughs> New Tesco. New Tesco's. Oh, my mum and dad are at the bottom of Talbot Road. <laughs> <laughs> Boring, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing there. Nothing. No. Tars 
Yeah. yeah. There is Tars ice cream. <laughs> it's Tars ice cream. Tars ice cream. But you just go through. Get yourself an ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> um, that bloke, he comes from Tars ice cream to every one of my gigs. Just... He just tries to shout. He's just trying to get publicity for Tars ice cream and everywhere he goes. It's work this time. I bet he's, I bet he's back here next week. There's... <laughs> um, there's another Brislington ice cream uh, claim to fame. Okay. Um, Anthony Minghella, <laughs> yeah, the director, the famous ice cream making director Anthony of Minghella, Truly Madly Deeply. The, Minghella, the director of English Patient, Truly um, Madly Deeply. Yeah, yeah. Um, his family um, owned an ice cream shop up near Prison and School and St Brendan's College. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Tars ice cream put him out of business yeah, because did. of his superior ice cream. <laughs> It's fucking good ice cream. <laughs> it really is amazing. The queue is... Anyway. Yeah. Um, to, so growing up in that area and being able to get paid any amount of money to talk shit and to talk to people for a living. Yeah. Like, I, I genuinely just, like, just blown away to just be able to do that. Yeah. And then all of my friends, you know, doing all these amazing things. I'm like, well, brilliant. But, like, look at me. I've, you know, got a... 10% Miss Millie's discount card. <laughs> uh, first bus to a one-stop hop, uh, three-stop hop for £1.20 into Temple Meat. I made it. <laughs> it used to be a pound, went up 20p. Yeah. Livid. <laughs> but because of the work that they're doing by Temple Meat at the moment, <laughs> the distance I can get on a three-stop hop <laughs> Fucking insane at the moment. <laughs> Honestly, wasn't expecting an applause. Break. <laughs> well, you still do stand up. Like I say, I think no one wants to talk about the, anything the apart gigs. from the roadworks around Bristol. <laughs> <and the laughs> we can talk about that. But the gigs I did, you know, you did the gigs at Richmond Springs. It's called something else now you told me before. But uh, so uh, I, I ran a gig called Clifton Comedy that became Oppo. Yeah. And I did that at uh, Channing's. I did that. It's called Oppo because uh, there was a place on Park Street uh, that I think is now a shisha bar um, on the corner by uh, where uh, <laughs> GBK was above there. Yeah. Um, so it's called Oppo. And so it's gone there and Channing's and it's now back at. Uh, the White Rabbit that was the Richmond Spring. Right. The Richmond Spring was like you did the Richmond it Spring. Was, it was a great gig. You headlined the Richmond Spring with one of your first like straight stand up shows, weren't you? When you yeah. did the yogurt show. Yeah. Um, and you were doing it. A guy called Matt Rudge was on first. And at about like eight o'clock, like half an hour before the show was going up, I got a phone call from Russell Brand who wanted to do an open spot. Like yeah. it was. Um, the Flight of the Concords did it. Yeah. The Flight of the Concords, it, it holds 60 people and the Flight of the Concords in the year after, the year they were nominated for the main award in Edinburgh, so 2004, um, did two hours. <laughs> two hour long sets, which I still have a bootleg mini wow. disc of. Um, Shame there's no way to play mini discs anymore, so <laughs> no, we'll, never, <laughs> we'll never hear that. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the shows we had there are amazing. Yeah. But do you know what? The shows we, we still have there are amazing. So yeah. Acaster did it uh, last year. Acaster did it um, in after. He did a preview of the show that he's doing now. That, and we booked it in on, I can't remember what the exact date was, but it coincided with the Croatia-England semi-final <laughs> in the World Cup last year. And so the, they p had the pub absolutely packed with people watching the football, yeah. and then we got rid of them, and then James Acaster went on right. and did an hour and a half right. in the Richmond Brick. Like, yeah, just yeah. amazing. And you're doing lots of you do lots of charity gigs as well, which is fantastic. So you do uh, belly laughs. Is this and is that the? Did you do some stuff for homeless people and some stuff? For yeah. Youth? So belly laughs is a project that I do uh, that is going into its third year, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. Has anyone been to a belly laugh? Oh, so a couple, so that's nice. I mean, not enough, but you know, that's fine. <laughs> so, Belly Laughs, uh, I came up with the idea for Belly Laughs in December 2017. I was doing the warm up for, I don't know if you know, I do a little bit of warm up. And 
Did you know no, that? Yeah, a little bit. Um, for Big Fat Quiz of the Year. Oh, yeah. And Big Fat Quiz of the Year goes on for about five and a half hours. And I was sat backstage, and I was on Twitter, and I was reading about all these, uh, these restaurants in Bristol doing their deals for January, 30 quid off, free bottle of wine, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and I thought, genuinely, <laughs> I thought to myself, hold on, if these people are trying to do deals to get people into their restaurants in January, I reckon I could do a gig in one of these restaurants and they could maybe give me a burger. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually, it was e- genuinely even more specific than that. There's a place uh, uh, in uh, St. Werberg's uh, called The Cauldron. I mean, genuinely, like, that is the sound of 45 people getting semi erection. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Al dente. <laughs> um, and I genuinely thought, I'll do a gig in the cauldron and maybe they'll give me a Sunday roast. The so Sunday roast is the best Sunday roast in Bristol. And I was like, so, and then I realised that actually, if I was doing that, I'm doing all right for myself. I can buy my own burger and Sunday roast. Um, and so I thought we could do it into a thing. So basically, what I do. In January, I find restaurants, uh, they get all the food money, they get all the booze money, um, they pay, audiences pay like a tenner as a supplement on top of the food to watch comedy, and all that money then goes to uh, the Julian Trust homeless shelter in Bristol, but we're doing it in a couple of other places, so it'll be the homeless shelters in Wales, and in Bath, and in Devon, so specifically there. Yeah. Um, and they're amazing. So we do, uh, we did like t- a festival. So yeah, so I did it in the end of 2017 and the first gig was like two weeks later and we did about 30 gigs that month. This year, what, 2019, we did about 45 gigs. We did a, a little comedy festival in Wapping Wharf where we had like 15 venues, sometimes doubling up, about 35 comics going to performing in front of six people or 150 people. Yeah. Um, it's, fuck, it's amazing. It, yeah. yeah, It's my favourite thing at the moment. And we're doing it again in 2020 and going bigger again. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. But we're also doing... Because <laughs> I like putting gigs on in places that, uh, that you just fucking do a gig. Cause, yeah. Because... Because I compare so much, I'm fairly good at trying to work out how to make a room feel like a room. I mean, because you are now at the back, at the top of your hill, yeah. you get to do amazing theatres. I do sometimes, yeah. But in a, couple of, uh, in a couple of weeks' time, I'm doing a gig for an amazing charity called Fair Share, who uh, get surplus food and then distribute it to any charity and any place that needs it. Um, and we're doing a gig in their warehouse. Right. Uh, behind Cabot Circus. John Richardson on the... This is going out after this. But yeah, yeah. I'll just well, tell the people. Yeah. Uh, John Richardson on the 18th of November. And then I'm doing a gig with Angela Barnes on the 19th of November in the Fair Share warehouse. Yeah. Um, Fair Share... Does anyone know Fair Share? Fuck it. It's unbelievable, <laughs> the stuff they do. Do you know about this charity? Well, I've only just from reading about it today, yeah. That's from, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're a national charity, and basically, there's a thing that if you get your food from, like, um, Waitrose or Tesco's or Ocado, and it's delivered to your house, if you're not there, the fresh stuff just goes to landfill. Right. So Fair Share, take that fresh stuff and give it out to um, rehab centres and... Uh, uh, after school clubs and breakfast clubs it's fucking amazing yeah. the food stuff I think I'm bored of comedy now I think the food <laughs> stuff I mean the food I find yeah. the food scene much more interesting yeah. than, than the comedy scene now yeah well it's good to give something back we're going to have to leave it there but we're leaving it on you looking like a fucking hero so <laughs> I guess that's alright isn't it thank you man. you made me How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>